It's just the day that I've had. I've been all over the place. <laughs> Is it? It's from a TV show? Good evening. Welcome, online folks. I see that we're live now. <laughs> we're in the middle of a conversation. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a couple, I apologize that we're a couple of minutes late tonight. I've had, a, had an eventful day, and we were talking about it, and we were running late getting the notes together. And forgive my rudeness while I mute my phone, because I thought, uh, thought I had it handled, but I did not. Okay, we're good. So, good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church, if you're here, <laughs> or if you're there, wherever you're at. I'm glad you're here tonight. Tonight is the second night of our series on the Holy Spirit. This is going to take... Uh, a while. Um, I've handed notes to the people in the room. If you're online watching and you want notes, um, let me know. Um, I actually, I've got a chat group that I forgot to check, and I think I've taken care of all of you today if you're watching tonight, but uh, I went four or five weeks and just forgot to log in because I was just busy, and I didn't check it, and uh, I had several of you that were asking for notes online, so if you didn't get an email from me today and you're in that group and you've got a four or five week old message to me, uh, hit me up again because I missed it in the catch-up. Um, but if you want the notes, I'll be glad to email them to you for this series. If you're in the room and you have them, great. If you want them, there's two more copies here, um, and I'll print more later. Um, if you're interested in giving, you can do that online. There's a, a link down below for our, or a link in, uh, I don't think it's below in the description, but it's on our Facebook page for the Tithely account that we have. You can hit us up there if you're interested. We're a 501c3, a real nonprofit. I don't take a salary. All that money goes into the church and the ministry that we do here, and uh Money for me is not ministry, so that's that's not where that goes. It's lights, it's internet, it's food for people that we uh, provide for in the community. It's events that we do to reach people for Christ. The other thing I'm going to let you know, everybody in this room, nobody knows this online or in the room. Um, next week, you're probably aware that it's a holiday, but what you're not aware of, uh, or many of you might not be aware of, is I'm going to be out of town next week. And given that we have a holiday and I'm going to be gone and we're in the middle of a series, I'm just going to say we're going to take next Wednesday off. So we will not be live streaming or in this room next Wednesday night. So um, enjoy your holiday. Enjoy your time with your family. Um, maybe find another great pastor to watch because there's a lot of people that will be having church. Uh, but we're going to take that time and spend it with our family and go out of town. And uh, I would encourage you guys to, to take a break as well. So if I missed any announcements that are important for people on Wednesdays, I think I got them all. All right. So let's get into this, uh, this series on the Holy Spirit. Last week, we, we did an introduction by talking about the Trinity. And I had taught on the Trinity just a couple of months ago, well, I say a, few, a couple, a few months ago, within the last year. Um, and I don't usually try to teach the same thing that close together, but in this series of talking about the, the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God, I felt it was necessary to establish the Trinity as a real thing. The Holy Spirit is God who is with us now and today. And uh, we talked about him being God within us, and we'll touch on that again um, in the course of this session. So if you missed that, go back and look. If not, I think this will stand alone um, and you'll be fine. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. So we may or may not get through this entire set of notes if you have them in the room. We'll just watch the clock and see, see how we go. Uh, yeah, watch it very closely. And, and do the thing where you tap your watch when you're ready for the preacher to shut up. And No, don't do that. <laughs> I've been places where they do that. It's very awkward. Never in a church that I was, uh, that, uh, that I was part of, but um, I've seen them do that to other people. Um, anyway, so the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray. We'll get into the notes, and we'll, we'll talk about who, excuse me, who the Holy Spirit actually is and, uh, and what does he do. So that's a, <laughs> that's a movie, too. <laughs> who is your daddy, and what does he do? So <laughs> we'll talk about the Holy Spirit in terms of in terms of who is he and what is his function. Let's pray real quick. Father, I thank you tonight for the chance to be with your people. I thank you that we can have fun and cut up. I thank you that you're keeping, keeping us safe and keeping us together and keeping us focused on you and learning. I pray that tonight that uh, your spirit will be present as we talk about him, that we'll be aware of who he is and we'll gain some knowledge of who he is, what he does, and what his purpose is, and how do we participate in that tonight. I pray that I'll speak clearly and that your people will receive your word and that it will benefit not just them as individuals, but it will benefit the kingdom of heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. So the person of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Trinity last week, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's a real thing. And we talked about those three persons. And we talked about the mystery of, of the Trinity, that even though that word is not in Scripture, it's a real thing. And we talked about the fact that, uh, how, did, how did we phrase it? We said that the three persons of God are still one God. Um, my, my favorite funny thing is still my friend online that got ridiculed for um, having a three-in-one shampoo God when she was debating with a Muslim. It's one of the funniest things I think I've ever heard anyone say. 
but we understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different entities, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit who is God with us now. So we're talking about him as a person, something we have to realize about the Holy Spirit, and something we need to realize about God in general is that God is not impersonal. There are lots of people that worship gods that are not personal. They're not relatable. They don't actually want to interact. Um, I, I'm not going to call out other faiths uh, tonight because I don't want to start a fight that's not necessary. But I will say there, is, there are many faiths that worship a god where they, they will make statements like, well, why would your god come down and be among you? Isn't he holy? Isn't he righteous? Our god is holy and righteous and has nothing to do with us because he's so different, and we have to get good enough to get to him. And... That's not the God that we serve, but that's the picture of many of the gods that we see in other faiths. The God of Scripture is a very personable, relatable God who interacts with us on a regular basis. You look at Genesis 126. Uh, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God made man in his image, and that's not just, I want him to look like me. I want him to be a reflection. God's not a narcissist that just wants to have little gods running around everywhere. Um, there are some faiths that might point you in that direction. Uh, that's not the case with Christianity. When God said, let's make man in our image, he wasn't just talking about what we look like. He wanted us to have a, a familiar sort of nature and function. There's a relatability in the same way between us and God that there would be between me and one of my boys. Um, neither of my boys are me, but if you spend about 0.8 seconds with them, you will find out very quickly they're a whole lot like their dad. They look like him. They have a sense of humor like him. Um, for better or for worse, they're obviously my kids. They're in my likeness. We're made in the image of God in very much the same way. We kind of reflect and resemble God. We're the only creation that God made that bears that resemblance. There's not another thing God made that looks like him. Not the giraffe, not the trees, not the rocks and the crystals, not the wind, not the sun. None of the other things God made look like God. We bear a resemblance to him. Genesis 2-7 talks about how we were formed it says the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. That word formed is an important word because if you look at how everything else was created, God spoke other things into existence, but he formed man. And that's a word that means he sculpted or fashioned mankind by hand. He actually put his hands on us. As we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that's going to be extremely important. So he formed us. We're the only creation that he touched when he made it. And it also says that he breathed. And that word is also important. It only happens two places in Scripture. This is the first one. We see God imparting his essence into mankind. He gave something of himself. He touched and formed us and then animated us with something of himself. We're the only creation that God made in that way. And then he continued to have a relationship with us. Genesis 3, 8 it says, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We are the only creation that God has recorded as having a personal relationship with. We're the only one that he made in his image and made himself available to. We're the only one that there's a record of him coming and spending time with. If you ever wonder if you're important to God or not, there's not a single record of any of the persons of God coming down and just hanging out among the wolves. There's not a record of him coming down and hanging out with any other part of creation, but he purposefully came and spent time with man and woman in the garden. And all of Scripture records the ways in which he has been spending time with mankind. You are the only creation God is personally vested in to the point that he appears and spends time with you. It's a very, very fascinating thing to look at and consider that the God of all creation, the God that made us, would come and hang out with us. It's, we we look, at, look at what we make and how often do you at your job make or build something that then you just want to sit and stare at and spend time with for ages and decades and lifetimes. It's like, it's pretty neat to look at what you did for a minute, but eventually the song you recorded, the end cap that you put up at the aisle, the spreadsheet that you made, whatever it is that you've done, yeah, that looks good. It's great. I'm really proud of that but I'm not coming back to hang out here just to say how great what I made is. It's a huge statement that the Lord made us and says, I want to be part of that in an ongoing sort of way. We're the only thing. And God came and spent time with man just for the enjoyment of his company. It says that the man and wife heard God walking in the garden. 
the sound of his footsteps was familiar to them. He did it often enough that it's just like I can tell most of the time which person is walking down the hallway in my house. I know if it's my wife or I'm, I know which of my kids it is if they're coming down the hall. I know if I hear a strange set of footsteps that that footstep doesn't belong here and I probably should pull that thing out of the top drawer that I keep to keep me safe if that happens. I mean, this is a familiar thing. God spent time and we're the only thing in creation that God did this with. So our creation is a very intimate and personal undertaking of God's. Our existence is a very personal investment God made by putting something of himself in us. And his relationship with us is an intense and personal kind of engagement. He's not watching from a distance. He's close to us. When we talk about God of creation, and we talked about the Trinity last week, we have God the Father, we have God the Son who walked with us, and then we have the Spirit of God who is God in us. The Spirit of God is also intensely personal. John chapter 20, verse 22 says he, Jesus, breathed on them, the disciples, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's the second time we see that word. The first time we see it in Hebrew, he breathed life into mankind. The second time God imparted something of himself to humanity is here, and he says, I'm placing my spirit inside of you. The spirit that he sent to us as a comforter and a counselor is not some detached or distant spirit. It's not a magician. It's not a ghost. It's not a magic fairy. It's God within us. It's an extension of creation that God says, now my spirit resides inside of you. We looked at 2 Corinthians 3.17 last week. It says, now the Lord is the spirit. The, The spirit that we have with us, the person of God with us now, today, is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. And he is still intensely personal. He's the most personal that God's ever been because, and if you look at scripture, it describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms. A lot of times people talk about the Holy Spirit and they do treat him like it's a genie. You rub the lamp. Okay, maybe you don't rub the lamp, but you do show up on Sunday morning wearing the right clothes and you sing the right song and you make sure that the smoke machine is working and the lights are working just right and the temperature is good and enough people have their hands up and now the Holy Spirit will show up and maybe if we're lucky, some people will fall on the floor. It's not rubbing a lamp and a magic thing to get the genie to show up. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. He's a very personal, very real, very with us all the time person of God. Scripture describes the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture in personal terms. And it's important, I think, that we understand this. We live in a culture and in a, we've been through a season. You look back at, you know, 2022 and all that COVID craziness. We, we were forced into isolation and it's changed the landscape of the world that we live in now. Our whole culture is different. And we are a whole lot more prone to isolate ourselves. Even social people prefer to do it through electronic means in a lot of cases. There's chat rooms and FaceTime and TikTok Live and whatever else it is you use to communicate with people. I mean, I'm teaching live to people that are online on Facebook right now rather than sitting in this room. And some of them could be here, but they prefer to interact in this way. So personal exchanges, even things that we say are intensely personal, they involve a whole lot less personal interaction than they used to. So it's more important than ever that we understand who and what the Holy Spirit is, that he's not some distant, faraway wizard or ghost or genie. It's the personal spirit of the Almighty God that is within you and available to you no matter where you are and what you're doing. There's not a form to fill out. There's not a special request to make. It simply is. The Spirit of God is with us. I want to look at some of the functions of the Holy Spirit tonight, and we may not get through all of these because it's a lot. Uh, If you've got the printed notes, you've already seen it's eight pages. It's one of the biggest things I've ever brought into this room to teach. Um, So we, we may or may not get through this in one sitting. But I want to look at some of the functions of the Holy Spirit and how personal they all are. The I've broken these down into a few categories. The first one, I've kind of grouped these together because of the verses they're in. The Holy Spirit comforts us teaches us, reminds us, guides us, and intercedes for us. This is something, of, this tells us a lot about who he is. I'm going to go through the verses that those terms come from. But before we even do that, I want to talk about what we think of when we hear those words. When I say someone who comforts you, what comes to mind? If you're in this room, answer me out loud if you're comfortable doing that. What's, what, when I think comfort or a comforter, what, what comes to mind for you? Somebody protects you and takes care of you. 
how intimate that is. Unpack that for me. Right. That's a very intimate thing. That's not like a stranger just walked by, hey, you're crying. Right. Oh, let me give you a hug. It's a whole lot more personal than that. He knows you well enough to know what's hurting you. Right. So for the benefit of people online, let me repeat that because I don't know how well this picks up. So she's saying it's a very per it's a very personal thing. It's not like a stranger that comes by and see you crying. It's someone who comes to you with the purpose or the intent of easing or soothing what's happening in your life. I'm trying to summarize that. Did I do that well enough? Okay. So, so comforting, teaching. When you think of teachers, what do you think of? Don't point at me. I know I teach, but <laughs> I, what's it? Homework. <laughs> and oddly enough, that may be a piece of it. Sometimes there is something we have to work on. Um, I, I know part of why I like teaching, some of it is a, is a a gift I think God's given me, but some of it is because of the impact that people who taught me had on my life. I've got a handful of teachers that that I had, especially in high school. I, I mean, I'm thinking of one in particular. Um, if you're watching Miss Morris, yeah, it's you. Um, she did watch for a while, uh, in a, for a period of time, some of what I was doing online. But there were times when she was even closer to me than my parents or my friends. And more, more than counselors or anybody else, even more than pastors, she was the one that was in my life every single day. That, and she was one that cared more than just to say, here's your English assignment. But she said, you don't seem to be doing as well today. I see some things that are happening in your life, and I noticed that you could use some help. So she wasn't just teaching me. Uh, I'm just going to say Miss Morris now. Miss uh, <laughs> Morris was not just teaching me English and debate and writing. She cared about me as a person, and she was teaching me how to be a good person through the process of learning those things. So I think about teachers and my personal experience and why I like teaching is because I want to be able to invest in people in that way. That's not a distant, weird thing. That's not a college professor. That's a, that's a grade school teacher. That's someone who's in your life on a regular basis. You think of these other words that get used, you know, reminding. We're gonna talk about that one in just a minute. You know, I don't typically care to be reminded by someone that I'm not close to. I'm just being honest. I don't want strangers to come up and poke me and say, hey, do you know the thing you forgot to do? Like, no, I, to, to tell you, you don't have the right to talk to me like that. That's what I forgot to do, obviously, <laughs> because here we are. Reminders, I prefer to get those from people that I love and that care about me and that have the same interests I do. So I want to look at those words together in a group for just a minute because we pull them out of the same verse. John 14, 26 is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send him in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. The Comforter is the term that Jesus uses, one of the terms Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit. The word that Jesus uses here, and it gets capitalized because he's giving it as a title, but the word itself, just at face value, it means to be called to one side, to be physically present to aid, to console, to assure, to advise, to give evidence, and to advocate. There's a lot of functions in this. It's a job description. It's a personality. It's not just a word that's an idea. We talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, and when Jesus uses a word to describe him, he gives you a personality type and a function. That's a whole lot, but that's the name Jesus gives to the function of the Spirit and to the identity and the, and the kind of personality the Spirit has. His function is to do things for us, or to his function is to do for us what we can't so that we are able to maintain our relationship with God and so we're able to accomplish the purpose of God. So this is not some mystical spirit that we summon just to do us a favor. He's with us all the time, helping us maintain the relationship with God that we're not good enough to keep ourselves. He's helping us accomplish the purpose of God that is bigger than what we can do. God helps those that helps themselves. Well, I mean, I get what people are trying to say, but really the Holy Spirit is helping us do what God said do. That's what's actually happening if we're following after Christ because God should be giving you a purpose that's too big for you. I had a conversation with a friend of mine just yesterday, and he was very excited after coming out of a prayer meeting. He said, I, the Lord said this thing. Uh, through the course of prayer and the way we were praying. And he said, if you're, if you're able to, if your vision is something you can accomplish yourself, then your vision is not big enough. And that's a sad place to be. 
you should have a picture of something that is much bigger than yourself that you need the Holy Spirit to help you with. Because who wouldn't want to have the Holy Spirit help them accomplish something they couldn't do themselves? That sounds like a cool afternoon. That's not like the bad dream where you have to build a go-kart with your landlord. That's like, you know, <laughs> this is a cool thing where we're going to do something together, me and the Spirit of God, that I can't do on my own. And I'm going to watch him do some things that I'm not capable of, and I get to say I was there for that. Even if all I did was hold the wrench or hold the flashlight, it's the coolest thing to say, God cares enough he wants to be present to help me do something I can't do alone. So the, the Spirit of God, he provides us with the spiritual and the physical and the emotional support that's necessary to do what God commands. Have you ever felt like God asked you to do something you couldn't? Have you ever once felt like, God, there's no way I can do that? And I don't mean go evangelize the whole world. Sometimes to say, do a simple thing, like change the way you eat, change the way you live, stop saying those words, seems like something that's impossible to do. If we'll be honest, if we're following after the Lord, we've been at some point asked to do something that seemed like there's no way on this side of heaven or hell that I could get this done. I just can't. The Spirit is the one that gives us the spiritual physical and emotional support that's necessary to do those things not just big massive crazy things that are like oh the spirit of god i'm not making fun of those things but we pin it just to that but the spirit is with me every day all the time the way a teacher or a pastor or a friend the way another human being that i invite to my life would be there for me to help me accomplish things i come up short hey you got an extra dollar i come up to a place where i can't reach the screwdriver can you hand it to me God wants to be there and be present for every little thing and help you do the things you can't accomplish, no matter how big or how small they might be on the scale of what we think the Spirit is doing. He's like, no, I want to be here all the time. He brings us peace and he brings us comfort in the midst of, of the inherent difficulty of following after Christ. Have you found that following Christ is hard? Anybody? Just me? That's okay. I'll be alone in this. I will tell you, I've had a hard time doing this. Um, and I have done it really, really badly at times. I have done it so badly at times, I have said, I'm just not even going to try to do this anymore. It's not worth it. And the only thing that has saved me and brought me back is the Spirit of God tapping me on the shoulder and being, but you know what's right. You know what you should be doing. You know there's a reason this isn't working for you. You know there's a reason you're unhappy when you go to bed at night, even though you accomplished so much in the eyes of your friends and your boss and your wife and whoever else. You've got to do this. He's there for you for every little thing because following the Lord is hard. And if we were just living from miracle to miracle and fantastic experience to fantastic experience, we would have a whole lot of our life that was absolutely miserable. Um, I've done a message with you guys once before about mountaintops and, and we talked about what does it actually mean to live in the valley? We have to learn to live there because the mountaintop is a very brief period of time. It's this big. And you got to walk all the way down and around and over here to get to the next one. What about the space in between? Where is God? What is he doing? The Holy Spirit is with you and in you right now. And you've got to learn to let him be part of and participate in every little bit of that journey from place to place. And stop focusing on or thinking he's not present if there's not some mountaintop billboard experience happening in your life. He's there for all of it. And thank God he's there for all of it because it's a hard walk. It's tough to do by yourself. The comforter. This is the personality and the person of the Holy Spirit. The other thing Jesus says in this passage that he does is he teaches us. Teach means to cause us to learn, to give instruction, and to impart knowledge and understanding. Cause us to learn, we get that. Sometimes we don't want to learn things. I have students at school when school is in session, which I have like 80-some days left before I have to do that again. Uh, we have students who ask questions like, why do we have to be here? Well, because the government says you have to be. And your parents dropped you off. And I'm in charge of you for the next six hours of your life. And that's just how it is. That's being caused to learn. Sometimes I don't want to learn things. But the Spirit will show up and say, hey, maybe you don't want to look at it this way. But if you're paying attention to your pastor this Sunday... He said that thing that you didn't want to listen to, but it actually matters and it's going to take place in your life and you're going to learn to deal with it because that was God telling you that. That's being caused to learn something. Sometimes unpleasant, sometimes I wasn't even looking to learn that, but it's been presented to me and now I've had to learn. Then there's also being given instruction. Hey, 
Have you considered going in this way? Or asking the Lord, I need some help. And he says, well, let me instruct you. Let me give you the instruction sheet. I installed some things today and I needed instructions to know how to put it together and how to connect it so it would work. That's, so sometimes we're forced to learn a thing or put in a position where we have to learn it. Sometimes we're given an instruction. We needed to learn it or we wanted to learn it, so here it is. And then there's this impartation of knowledge and understanding. Again, I had a good conversation with a friend of mine uh, yesterday um, in the group of you that, that, that I unfortunately have had to apologize that I didn't get your notes to you on time. Um, but I had a conversation with someone from that group and we went off down a rabbit trail for a little bit about how there are lots of people that have a whole lot of knowledge and they're very smart people, but they lack the ability to apply it and have never had any experience with having to do anything with what they know other than tell people how smart they are. Um, the thing that came up in our conversation was you get, you get online theologians in the circle we walk in, people that, that on Facebook or on TikTok or on YouTube feel that they are so smart and are validated by their audience in feeling like they're smart. And they feel that their, their job is to just tell people all the smart things they know about the Bible. And they think themselves leaders when, number one, there's no one following them because, number two, they've never gone anywhere. <laughs> it's very difficult to say I know how to stage a successful missions trip when I've never been on a mission. It's very difficult to say I know how to be a good pastor or a good teacher when you've never taught to anyone but a camera and you've never pastored anyone over a period of time. You run into this with all kinds of people in all kinds of fields, but the Christian environment seems to be quite full of it. Teaching is not just saying, here's how smart I am and let me tell you what I know. Teaching the way the Holy Spirit does comes with understanding. Here's the smart thing you need to know, but here's what it means and here's how to use it. A lot of us lack that. And that doesn't mean that we're all arrogant, but oftentimes we will hear something. The pastor says it, or I've read that scripture a thousand times, or I heard this idea, but I don't, I mean, what does that mean? That's great, but what, it, what does it mean? And how do I use it? How does that apply to me? That's what the Spirit does. He teaches us things. He gives us knowledge, but he also gives us the ability to understand things. The Holy Spirit is the source of everything that we understand about God. The Word of God provides the instruction. God is always giving commands and making declarative statements, but it's the Spirit that gives understanding and revelation to those things. You look at John uh, 16, 13. Jesus is speaking, and he says, When the Spirit comes, he will guide you into the truth. One translation says he will reveal the truth to you. I know a lot of things, but I need the truth to be revealed. I need understanding of what I know. The leading of the Holy Spirit is what brings us to a place where we understand the scripture that we read, the conversations that we have, what's actually going on behind the scenes. Lord, I, I don't get it, but I seem to be running into lots of people or lots of people have this problem or I'm, I'm in this place and I, something doesn't feel right and I don't know why. The Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we start to understand what's actually going on. Oh, there's a demonic spirit there. That's why. Oh, this person is not in the will of God. Oh, that's not God's will for me, and that's why I'm not comfortable there. Suddenly, we start to understand things. We understand Scripture. We start to understand how the Word of God applies to our circumstances. We start to see how God is actually working in our lives and even identify the places where God is not. That's the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's the kind of teaching and guiding that He does. And in the midst of that, he will also reveal the peace and the presence of God even when we find ourselves in a place where I don't understand what's going on. I don't know where you guys are at, but I frequently find myself in a place with God where it's like, okay, I feel like I've done what you said do, Lord. I've followed your instructions, and I made the decisions you wanted me to make, and I've made the changes you asked me to make, and now I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm just in this place where I've done the things and said the things, and now what? And sometimes what the Spirit teaches us or reveals to us is that we can have peace and we can realize I am in the presence of God even though I don't understand what God is doing right now. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. And quite frankly, I need that a whole lot more often than I need to blather something nobody can understand or fall on the floor or see gold dust rain from the ceiling. I need that a whole lot more. Lord, give me peace where I'm at. God, help me understand this thing that doesn't make sense to me. God, let me see where you are in this and let me be okay when I don't get it. The Holy Spirit is very personal and very practical 
in that way. He teaches. The other thing that passage, John 14, 26, Jesus says he reminds us of things. He will cause you to remember or to call attention to or to bring something into your mind. The Holy Spirit most frequently brings to mind what God has said to us. He will remind us of things that have been said. One of the things that I love about this passage when, when Jesus says this, the Holy Spirit will cause you to remember, to, to remember everything that I've said. He's saying this to the disciples. And he's not saying, I'll cause you to remember everything that I said just to you one-on-one. -on -one. I have the ability because I am the Holy Spirit, or Jesus says the Holy Spirit has the ability to cause you to remember anything that God has said or done, anything that I've ever read, any principle or concept that falls under the will and purpose of God, he can cause that to come to mind. That's what reminding means. The Holy Spirit will bring God's word to mind to you, sometimes even when you don't know it's scripture. Psalm 119, 11 does say, David writes, and he says, I've hidden your word in my heart. It's great to memorize as much scripture as you can and read as much as you can. You'll be surprised what you will recall, even if you haven't memorized it. I can't count the number of times I have had a thought and said, I know in the Bible it says somewhere because I've read the verse and I may even remember a piece of it. And I might have to go back and do the research on it. But in the moment, the spirit helps me remember, oh yeah, the Bible says this thing. Even if I don't know the address, it's in there. Let's go look it up together. I use that phrase with some of you because it, it comes from a friend of mine who gave a testimony one time. He, he, says, uh, he says, I'm going to tell you all a lot of scripture tonight. I might not remember the address where it is, but I know what's in there. <laughs> I love, love that, and I've stolen it for years. Um, I don't always know chapter and verse, but I can find chapter and verse. What's most important when I'm living my life is that I understand the principle of it. I understand the word of God, and I know what to do with it. The Spirit can teach me and, and remind me, or the Spirit can teach me and help me understand what something says, and then he can remind me of it even if I've forgotten it. It's wise to remember as much as you can. It's wise to memorize as much as you can, but the Spirit will help you remember things because sometimes we hide things so well we forget where we put them. I don't know if this ever happens to you. Occasionally, I will have something that is so special. I think, I'm going to put that in a place. I'll never forget where it is. And 15 minutes later, I don't know what I did with it. <laughs> Certainly not 15 hours or days or years later. It's like, I know I put that in a special place, but I don't remember where it is. And then over time, if I've not laid eyes on it, I might forget what the thing looks like. The Spirit of God can help me remember what's gotten hidden. The Holy Spirit will call attention to something that I didn't consider. He'll give me a new perspective. He'll give me God's perspective on something. He'll cause me to see things in a way that I didn't even know existed before. The Holy Spirit can also get involved in your thoughts. This idea of reminding means that he can come in and help you have a godly thought instead of the one you wanted to have. Can you ever think of a time that might be worthwhile? <laughs> that I wish I had God's thoughts on this. <laughs> I've had plenty of times when I said, I shouldn't say that, and I probably need to repent for thinking it. <laughs> because I wish I had godly thoughts all the time, but I don't. The Spirit of God can remind me of what God's thoughts and things are. It's funny to think about it in the context of something inappropriate you might say, but where it gets even more important is when I start listening to things about myself. I'm a terrible Christian. I'm a bad person. I've failed. I've missed God. I'm not who he says I am. I'll never do what he says I can do. The Holy Spirit can call your attention back to what the Lord says about you. Here are God's thoughts about you. The Spirit can bring that to mind in a moment when you have forgotten and feel desperate. Lord, what, do, what must I look like to you? As, as fortune would have it, as the Spirit of God would have it, he's present to tell you and remind you. Jesus says, I'll remind you of everything I've told you. There's not a single person that's memorized all of Scripture or that can remember everything that anyone has ever said to them that was good that came from God. But the Holy Spirit knows everything that God's ever said, and he knows whether you read it in the Bible or whether, whether he used someone else to speak it to you. He knows all that stuff, and he can cause it to come to your mind. We know it's God, and we can go back and confirm that with his word. I would never, and I will never tell you, you know, let's pluck something from the ether that's amazing and special that tells me how good I am, that just affirms me as a person for no reason other than to make me feel good. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's not what he does. We talked a little bit about that on Sunday with encouragement. 
But if the Lord has really spoken something to you, if it's something God has caused you to remember, the Spirit has reminded you of, you'll be able to go back and find that in Scripture, like that idea where I said, I think I know this is in the Bible somewhere, let's find it. Or someone says something encouraging to you and you say, is, is that actually God? Is that godly? Well, let's go look it up. Hey, there's, there's 36 verses in the Bible that are kind of what that person just said about me. That must have been from the Lord. It really is something he would say. You can confirm what the Spirit reminds with the Word. And you can then confirm that the Spirit actually does do what we're saying he does. He reminds us of things. Imagine that. The Spirit actually does what Jesus says it does, if we'll let him. Over a period of time, we'll get to a place where we start to recognize that voice that reminds us. And in fact, we will prefer it over our own. And a lot of times we give the enemy credit for giving us bad thoughts or reminding us of bad things. But we do a plenty good job of dredging up our own garbage and thinking about what we think. Uh, of ourselves or other people or thoughts we shouldn't have. Over time, when we spend time listening to the Spirit and become familiar with Him, we'll start to recognize it's His voice that's reminding me of things. And I prefer that voice, and we'll start going to that voice first. And that word voice is incredibly important. Remember, this is personal. The same way that Adam knew the sound of the footsteps of God in the garden, we start to become familiar with the personality of the Holy Spirit, with the way that he teaches, with the way he reminds, and the way that he speaks. So he teaches us, he reminds us, his personality is that of a comforter. Scripture also says that the Spirit of God leads and guides us. We touched on this briefly in another verse, but let me give you this one, Romans 8, 14. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. You also look at John 16, 13. He will guide you into the truth. That's the one we looked at earlier. That word led means to give direction. And this happens in one of two ways. And I love this. I, for the long, I've read this verse so many times and for some reason had never studied this word. And now that I know it, it's one of the coolest newer things that I think I have learned in Scripture. The Spirit of God will lead us in one of two ways. He will either give direction by accompanying us in the same way you would a child, take my hand, let's walk across the street. Let me be with you as we go on this hike through the woods. Even in this difficult time that you're in, this hard time, in this moment of hating yourself because of the mistake that you've made, let me sit with you in that and get you through it because it looks like you're having a hard time. I will accompany you and lead you into, through, and out of the place where you have found yourself. That's accompanying us. But then also that word led means give direction by accompanying or by laying hold of. Remember I told you how we're formed. God's hand touched us to shape us and form us. This is another way that God actually leads us by the Spirit of God laying hold of. This is not figurative language. It means literally taking control of by laying hands on. In the same way that we're formed by the hand of God, we're led and directed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit will sometimes walk with you and point you in a direction, but other times He will physically direct you somewhere. He will push you in a direction you don't understand. He will pull you out of harm's way. Like it's, I, I use this example. I have a friend when I was younger who was so trained to the sound of his father's voice that when he heard his father speak, he would just stop and immediately pay attention. I wish my kids would do that. Sometimes I have to use the dad voice. <laughs> but... But he was well trained. But there was a time when he was walking out in front of a car and about to get hit. And the dad said his name and he just stopped. And the car went by very close to him and nearly hit him. Saved his life because the kid was trained to his voice. Not every person is trained that well. I personally, when it comes to the things of God, am not always so well trained that just because I, I remember or hear or think of something God says that I stop doing the thing I shouldn't do. Sometimes I've already given up. Sometimes I'm mad. Sometimes my person or my, my emotions are in a bad place and I just don't care. I know you can't believe that. If you don't want me to be pastor, I'm sorry. <laughs> not sorry. I'm a human being. And I have times when I just don't care what God said. I'm in a bad place and I'm going to make a bad decision. And I have to repent just like anybody else does for that. And sometimes when you find yourself in a place like that, God, instead of just saying the voice, the Spirit of God will grab, the, grab your collar like a father yanking the kid out, and from, out from in front of the vehicle that's going to hit him. Physically leading you by laying hands on you. We have to be careful that we don't 
curse the enemy for tossing us around. Sometimes we're like, oh, the enemy's come and he's beating me up and he's doing this and he won't let me do that and he shoved me into this and just God deliver me. Sometimes we're not familiar enough with the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us that it's actually the Spirit of God that's laying hands on you, trying to lead you and guide you and direct you and save you from yourself in the midst of your circumstances. The Spirit is very personal and wants to be there for us. He wants to lead us and guide us and direct us by any means possible so long as we'll give him the opportunity to. That kind of border, I mean, I hate to use the word violent, but, you know, it does look difficult when you see a dad grab his kid or a mom grab the child who's about to fall out of the shopping cart or go over the side of the waterfall. We're not worried about being kind and gentle and friendly when someone's in trouble. We're worried about saving their life. For the Spirit to have to lead you by physically laying hold of you may not look or feel the most comfortable, but praise God that He does it. Because there are plenty of times when spiritually I need to be rescued in a way that is violent, whether I like it or not. And that kind of intervention leads to the next thing that the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit of God intercedes for us. Romans 8.26, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. The idea of intercession is not just that the Holy Spirit sits around and prays quietly for us. Now, we know prayer is just a conversation with the Lord, so obviously the Holy Spirit is in conversation with Jesus and, and, and with God. And we see in the beginning, when God creates the heaven and the earth, they have a conversation. So there's conversation happening there. There's prayer, or what we would call prayer, happening there between them. But the idea of intercession is something bigger. It's the kind of conversation being had. When we say someone is interceding and the Spirit is interceding, we say they're making a case for us. They are intervening in something on our behalf. They're getting involved in something that, that they want to say, my influence needs to be felt here. So what case is the Holy Spirit making? When I think about the Holy Spirit is personal and with me and has a voice and wants to lead and guide and direct and comfort and teach me and remind me of things, why would he be interceding? What's the case he needs to make? He's making a case not just to God, but also to us that we would be in alignment with the will of God. We think of intercession being one way. It's just me talking to God, but if the Spirit is interceding and he's intervening sometimes physically and even violently in my life, it's because his desire is that God sees us through the grace that Jesus provided, but also that we see God for who he is in our situation. The Holy Spirit is not just praying that God's going to bless us. He's making a case to God about the places where we have become aligned with him. Have you considered my servant and what they've done? The places where we've become aligned with God, where we have repented, where we believed, where we've accepted the grace provided through the sacrifice of Jesus, where we've said, I believe what you said, Lord, about me, in spite of the fact that I kind of hate myself right now. The fact that even though I've made some mistakes, I'm still loved by you and I'm still cared for by you. Lord, have you considered that they even believe those things? It's important. The Spirit of God wants us aligned with the will of God. He's making a case to God to say, here are the things where they have aligned with you, Father. But the Holy Spirit is also making a case to us in his teaching and his guiding and his reminding that it is important that we align ourselves with the will of God. When we wander from God or we start off in a direction that would separate us from him, the Spirit of God will intervene. Oftentimes that's what's going on when we say there's a physical leading taking place. I feel like the Lord wants me to go here or is telling me not to go here. The Spirit of God intervenes. Sometimes he does it with a quiet voice. You see that in 1 Kings 19.12. Sometimes you see him doing something a little more profound, like Romans 8.14, laying hands upon us. Both cases, whether it's the still quiet voice we learn to listen to or whether it's God doing everything possible to ruin the plans that we had made that would take us out of his will, both of those things are a product of the intercession of the Holy Spirit. It works both ways. God is making a case to us to stay in his will. And the Spirit is also making a case to God that says through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, these are yours. Don't forget them. Part of that comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit is the fact that he is always counseling us. He's counseling us in the ways of the Lord. He's teaching us the ways we should go and guiding us away from our dangerous and selfish inclinations. The Holy Spirit has got the big picture in mind, and he's always teaching us the things that we need to know. And remember, I told you earlier, sometimes he will cause you to learn something. He's not always teaching you what you want to know. And that's when we get frustrated with him. I want to know why I'm here. 
I want to know what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to know why you let that thing happen. The Holy Spirit says, perhaps what we need to learn right now is to be at peace in the midst of God orchestrating your life. It's a hard place to be. But the Holy Spirit does that just as willingly as he does provide miracles and astounding experiences that we would have with him and sit with us through the good times as well. He does that because he has a personal interest in you. He's got a personal interest in restoring your relationship with God and restoring your purpose in living for him. When we look at God and the Holy Spirit and the personality or the person of the Holy Spirit, there's a a handful of differences, and I'm going to end here tonight. I've got a lot more, but we'll just split this into two pieces and talk about the other things the Spirit does next week. But based on just where we've gotten to in this point, looking at what is the personality of the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the difference between God and the Holy Spirit is that God declares things. The Holy Spirit comforts us in the midst of them. God decrees things. This is how it's going to be. The Holy Spirit then comes and teaches us and brings us understanding to what God has said is going to happen or must happen. God commands, go do this, go say this, don't do this, don't say that. The Holy Spirit guides, okay, we heard what the Lord said, now here's how we're going to get there and make that happen. God judges, here's what I see, here's how it is. In the last day, he's the one that decides, separates sheep and goats. The Holy Spirit says, I am interceding. I am making sure that you are in the will of God so that when God judges, you're standing in the right place. Does that help give a picture tonight of the Holy Spirit that is perhaps a little different than what you've seen up to this point? Lots of you are nodding. That's good. So I hope this is helpful. If this is still good for you, well, whether it's not, whether it is or not, I feel like this is where the Lord told me to go. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to split there tonight. Um, So if you've got notes now, you'll have notes for next week. But we're going to continue to talk about the personality and the function of the Holy Spirit in our life as an everyday entity in addition to those big billboard miracles. For tonight, remember him as a comforter, as someone who is personally involved with you in every single detail of your life, whose goal is is to make sure that you stay in the will of God and to make sure God is still aware of you. Let's go and pray. Father, I thank you this evening for the opportunity to look at your spirit in this way, to see him as he is, not just as we may have been told. I pray that what we've looked at tonight, Father, will encourage us and comfort us in the way that you intended when you gave us the spirit in the first place. I pray that you'll continue to keep us safe until the next time that you have us together. And you'll give us opportunity to experience your spirit in the way that we have learned who he is tonight in the time between now and when we're together again. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys. If you're online, I'm going to sign off now. If you're in the room, we can talk for a bit. If you don't feel like staying and talking, you're dismissed.